Have you ever heard of the five love languages? How many of you have heard of that? So in 1992, Gary Chapman wrote a life-changing book. It was one year before I was born. This book is older than me, which means it's older than dirt. If you're older than me, that doesn't imply anything upon, upon you. Okay, I, I'm just, we're going to start over. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, he wrote this book called The Five Love Languages, and it was essentially what Gary was saying is that there are five different ways, five main ways that you can demonstrate love for someone else. There's five main ways that you can also receive love from somebody else. Does anyone know what, can anyone shout out what some are? Physical touch, yes. Acts of service, words of affirmation, gifts, one more. Quality time, there it is. So we have quality time, that's time you spend with someone, sitting on the couch, watching a movie, going out to dinner, that's quality time. Physical touch, self-explanatory, a kiss, a hug, holding hands. These are things that make you, some of you leaned into each other. I love that. You guys are awesome. <laughs> That's physical touch. Acts of service, actually going out of your way to do the dishes, wash the car, things like that. Like you're, you're serving your, the, your spouse, your significant other, your friend. You're serving them. Words of affirmation, saying, you are great. That was so awesome what you did. I love you. It's using, using your voice to, to, to affirm someone, to make them feel good, to make them feel loved. And then finally, there's gifts, giving them a gift. It could be something you bought from the store. It could be something that you made, something you put thought into. As someone, my, so my love language is gifts. So as someone who, who feels that way, it's, it's, it's usually like, something you put thought into. That makes me feel good. So these are all five different things that if you do them to someone else, you make them feel good. And everybody, they say that has, everybody has one main love language. You can appreciate a couple of them. You can really not appreciate some of them. But there's usually one, maybe two, that you really appreciate, and that is your love language. So mine is gifts. Sarah's is acts of service. I don't know what some of yours are, but we all have one. And why do you think it would be important for you to know your partner or your friends, someone you know in your life, why is it important to know their love language? Yeah, you need, the reason it's important to know someone else's love language is that is the best way that you can show them love. Because what, what we tend to do as humans is, you know, my love language is gifts, so I tend to want to show love to other people by giving them gifts. But that doesn't work if their love language is not gifts. For example, my wife Sarah, her love language is acts of service. Sarah is, God, like, God bless me with this, Sarah is one of the most not materialistic people I've ever met. Like, Sarah, it's true, and I am doubly, triply blessed <laughs> by, by that. And so I learned pretty early on in, my, in our relationship that, like, I could give her a gift, and sometimes she would appreciate it, but a lot of times she'd be like, well, thanks, <laughs> you know? Like, that's very nice, but, it, you know, it, it, it didn't touch her heart in the way that I wanted to, and that's not on me because I didn't know her love language yet. But once I did learn her love language, that her love language was acts of service, I started loving her in a way that she would feel. I started loving her in a way that she would understand, that would make her feel loved. So that's why yesterday I seeded our entire lawn. <laughs> and, I, and I dug up five old, what are they called? Box. We went to someone's house on offer up. We dug up five old boxwood hedges. It took us hours. Oh my, they were so deep in the ground. It was such a pain. I was, I was, I was, I was grumbling the whole time. <laughs> but I did it because I loved her and she appreciated it. And now we have five nice boxwoods on the side of our property that were only $10 a piece. It was great. Minus, minus labor. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> so I love Sarah in a way that she understands because I know 
her love language. And in the same way, she loved me in a way that I understand because she knows my love language. We are in a sermon series called No Greater Love. And it's all about how deep, how vast, how wide, how immeasurable God's love for you is. It's amazing. If you go through the Bible, this is a love letter to you. It is God saying, I loved you so much. I was willing to lay my life down for you. It says there's no greater love than someone who lays their life, someone who lays their life down for his friend. And that's what Jesus did for you, is this great love, this great demonstration of his love. And I love how I love, I love, there's a lot of love going on. God demonstrates that love to us in ways we understand. God knows our hearts. He created us all individually. He knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. So he knows there are different things for each and every one of you that make you feel loved. Quality time, physical touch, acts of service, words of affirmation, gifts. He loved you in all those five ways and more. He came down from heaven. And he lived among us, spending quality time with us. He was not content to stay in heaven. He says, I'm coming down. I need to be with these people. He took on flesh so he could physically touch us. God is spirit, and yet he took on flesh so he could touch you. He he, he touched the untouchable. It says he, he prayed over and healed lepers, those we weren't allowed to touch. He says, I'm going to touch you in the greatest act of love and healed their, iniqu- healed their affliction. You know those lepers, lep- leopards. those lepers felt loved when he reached out and touched them. An act that would have made him ceremonially unclean. He said, I'm going to do it anyway because they need love. He met them where they were at. He humbled himself, performing acts of service to us, to his disciples. It says the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. This is the king of the universe. Humbled himself, serving another person, serving all of you. He spoke words of affirmation into our lives saying, you are loved. You are God's children. I'm willing to die for you. That's how valuable you are. And he gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is like the best gift ever, because it means we have God with us constantly. And it is the sign, and it is the seal of our salvation. If you have the Holy Spirit, that means you're good. You know you are with God at all times. You see, when God reaches down and shows you love, he does it in a way that you can understand, he does it in a way that you can appreciate, and he does it in a way that makes you feel loved. It feels good to rest, to abide in the love of the Father. It's a positive feeling, and this is what we have to look forward to, not only in our time of earth, but for eternity. The love of the Father just lavishing on us. Isn't that good? Isn't that good news? Praise God. It even says God went farther from the five love languages because, you know, the five love languages, they happen within a relationship. They, I love my wife. We love our kids. We love our friends. They happen within a relationship. Well, God created a deeper relationship with us. And he loved us in a completely new way. 1 John 3, verse 1 says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. His love came in just the spirit of adoption. We were not his by birth. We were children of the world. We were children of sin, children of the world system. And yet God said, plucked us out of the pit and said, I'm going to make you mine. I'm going to call you a Christian, one who is a follower of Christ. And I'm going to treat you with the same, give you the same inheritance that I give my firstborn son, Jesus. The Bible says that we are co-heirs with Christ. The inheritance, eternal life, we life forever in the presence of the Father, we get that because he has adopted us as his children into the kingdom. Very good news. Very good news. 
So God demonstrates his love for us in a way that we understand. My question for you guys, then, knowing that, is how do we demonstrate our love to the Father in a way that he understands, in a way that makes him feel loved, in a way that makes him feel cherished and appreciated? How do we do it? I remember when I was six years old, right, right about, I don't know, it's all a blur. Six years old, seven years old, and it was Christmas morning. And I just remember it was a really good Christmas. I remember sitting on the floor, we do the little circle where we each open one gift at a time, and by the time we were all done, I remember just we had been given awesome gifts. You know, my parents always had like a pretty strict budget. We were, they were never rich or anything. But they always, my, my parents, they always went out of their way to get us really good gifts. Um, and I remember this Christmas, my, my parents had gotten me this transformer car. It was blue and it had flames on it, and it turned into a robot. And I was sick, so I couldn't do it, so my dad had to do it at my beck and call. Dad, please transform this. Okay, sure, you know. <laughs> But I remember that car, and I loved it. And I just remember sitting there and feeling just the love of my parents that they lavished upon me. And looking back upon it now, I see that they lavished their love upon me. It was wonderful. And I appreciated it. And I felt love. My, my love language is gifts. I felt love. They, they saw that car, they thought of me, and said he would love that, and I did. And I did. So I remember that. But you know what I also remember? I remember after all the kids' presents were done, you know, after the kids' presents were done, then it's mom and dad's turn to, like, get whatever whatever meager (laughs) things their kids gave them. (laughs) Is anyone familiar with that? So, So it was our turn to give our parents the gifts that we had made for them. And so I handed my dad this aluminum foil package, because I used to wrap everything in aluminum foil. And I handed it to him, and he opened it. And to understand this thing, to understand this, what I gave him, you have to understand that my dad loves classic cars. And during this time, he had a 1970 Cutlass, Oldsmobile Cutlass, baby blue. It was sick. I think this is the car. Like, I was like, is that my front yard? I'm trying to figure it out. He eventually sold it, so I think that's where this picture... But this was the car. This was it. Two-door. And he loved this car. He worked on it all the time. He rebuilt the engine top to bottom, did it all himself. It was, it was, like, it was like his second love or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, he loved this car. And so what I had decided to do in my six-year-old brain is I decided to make him a little Play-Doh like replica of the car. And I took some toothpicks formed some clay around it. It was really cool. I had a little pink racing stripe on there because I was like, this is how you top that. It needs a pink, a pink racing stripe right across the side. It didn't look, I, I don't have a picture of the real one. This looks better than the one I made. <laughs> yeah, this looks better than the one I made. So basically I gave him, so he, he holds in his hand, he holds this aluminum foil package and he starts to unwrap wrap it and he looks at it and he sees what it is and he just weeps. He just weeps. He loved it. He saw that car and he looked at it and he said, this is great. My son made this for me, took the time to make it. And it was meager, people. Like, it was not good. Okay? Like, he looked at it and said, my son cared enough about me to make it for me. I just have this picture in my head of him just breaking down and him saying, like, you made this for me? Like, you made this for me? And he loved it. He cherishes it. He probably still has it somewhere. My dad likes to keep everything. We have a... (laughs) There's there's like a little um, Kodak film canister that has all our teeth in it. (laughs) Oh, man, that shifted the mood. Anyway, so I I I gave him this gift... That, that he just loved, he just appreciated so much. And what, I, what happened in that moment is that by accident, I had discovered my dad's love language. And it was gifts, just like me. I guess it's genetics. 
And so he, he saw that little meager, measly toy car, and he just thought, this was great. You took the time to make this for me. I love it. I cherish it. I love you. I feel loved. He, my dad felt loved in that moment by one of his kids, and there's like no greater feeling on the earth, right? He felt loved. And now, now that I know my father's love language, years and years and years and years into the future, now I can continue to love him in that way. I can spend time buying him gifts or making him gifts, even better. I remember I made him these, I'd like take apart VCRs as a kid, and I like, there was a part that made a ticking sound, like when you spun it, and I glued a little army man on it, and it went and he loved that. <laughs> He's like, this is the coolest thing ever. I was like, yeah, it shoots. <laughs> my mom is like, what are you doing breaking apart my VCR? <laughs> but my dad loved it. And I, can, and I don't get it right all the time, okay? Like a couple years back, I bought my dad a hat, okay? And it was like, thanks. <laughs> but I try my best. And knowing his love language, I, I, I try to honor that. And I try to love him in a way that he understands. It's something I work toward. Okay, now I'm going back to the question. God loved us so much, he lavished his love upon us in ways we understand. Quality time, physical touch, acts of service, words of affirmation, and gifts. It is Christmas morning. It's been Christmas morning for 2,023 years. And we're all sitting on the floor surrounded by ribbons and bows and paper and all of the great gifts that our Father has given us. We all got Transformers, people. We got them all. Everything that God has given us. Now it's our turn. What can we give the Father that makes Him feel loved, that makes Him feel appreciated? How do we demonstrate our love to the Father in a way that He understands, in a way that makes Him feel loved? Any ideas? Worship and praise, yeah. We all go out and buy some Play Doh. 1 John 2, verse 3, gives us a very clear perspective on this. God loved us so much, so what? 1 John 2, verse 3 says, And we can be sure that we know God, that we have a relationship with Him, if we obey His commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, the Bible says that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. Those who follow and keep God's commandments show, they demonstrate how truly, how completely, how they're giving up their lives to show that they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. And that's a big call. But that is what it takes to make God feel loved. He has lavished so much upon us. He has loved us so much. And so we look at that. We feel that love. That's why we always say, you know, we, we, we always say, and this is very important to know for your faith, God loved you freely. God accepted you freely. And it is not by your works, it's not by what you do that you are saved. Like, God, that's, that's, all, that's all on God. But because you are saved, because you are loved, it is a response. You're looking at God and saying, you loved me so much, I want to love you back, and so I'm going to change my life. I'm going to change the way that I live. I'm not going to live the same way anymore. I'm not going to follow, follow the world. I'm not going to be sinning all the time, pursuing sin, doing what I know is wrong. I'm going to be looking at your word, listening to you in prayer and saying, how do I do redirect my life so that I can love you better, God? And you're not going to get it perfect. You're not. No one is. I'm a sinner. We are all sinners. 
What God cares about, though, is that you are working at it. It's like that Play-Doh car. It wasn't perfect. It was messed up. You know, it, it was whatever. It, it wasn't great. But God appreciates that we're trying. He appreciates that we're working at it. We are all works in progress. The Bible is so clear. You will not be perfect. You won't get it right until you're in heaven with God. So this life, it's like practice. But we need to be, but it's serious practice. We can't just like throw everything to the wind and say, well, I'm forgiven. I'm just going to go live whatever way that I want. You can't. Because the Bible is clear. The proof that you are saved is how you live. Because the Bible promise a, promises a transformed life. A transformed life. So if you don't have any transformation, if your life is the same after you were saved as it was before you were saved, then I don't know if you were. God's love is real and it is transformative. And so that's why, that's why we seek after change. That's why we abandon the sin. We say, I don't want to live that way anymore. That's why every single week we say, I turn from my sins, I turn for, to God, and I'm going to follow him wherever he leads. Because that is the path he has for us. And it is so good. It is so good. Amen? Amen. We love God by keeping his commandments. That's his love language. It's obedience, it's submission, it's following him. It's saying, as Isaiah 55 does, God, your thoughts are nothing like my thoughts. And your ways are far beyond anything I can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so your ways are higher than my ways. And your thoughts are are higher than my thoughts. And yes, if you were following along in your Bible, I did change that a little bit. I just swapped the yours and the mys. It's saying the same thing. God is bigger than us, and his ways are better than us. He knows best, and God has given us instruction, commands, direction for our lives. And we say, God, I will follow. Even as the world lies to me, how many of you know the world is lying to us? The world systems, all of these things that are like, just we go around and we see how people who are not Christians live. They've, they're selling us a false gospel, saying you can live whatever way you want. They say sex is free. They say money is everything. You can get happiness from a bottle. You can get happiness from a pill. You should prioritize yourself over other people. You can be a boy if you want. You can be a girl if you want. You can kill your baby if you want. All roads lead to heaven. You can believe whatever you want. It doesn't really matter because really at the end of the day, all religion is fake. You're going to close your eyes at the end of your life and it's just going to be black. You are just a blip in the cosmic like realm of space. These are the lies that the world tries to convince you of. And we say, I'm not going to live that way. I'm not going to live that way. Instead, we say, I will follow you, God. I will obey you, God. I will love only you. Because it's a matter of allegiance. Are we allied to the world that says all these evil, wicked things? Or are we allied to God who is calling us to something greater, something powerful? He's calling us to be men and women, soldiers in his kingdom. And above and beyond everything else, the greatest love that he laid down his life for, for us so that we can become children of God and have an inheritance of eternal life forever with the Father. That is what happens when you love God. And you say, I will not love the world. I will love the Father. I have to make a choice, and you have to make a choice. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. You can't. It is, there's nothing more dangerous 
Because when we say the salvation prayer, I will follow you, I will make you my Lord, I will make you my Savior, I will make you my Master, that is a bowing down. It is a submission. And that is the only way you can enter into the relationship with God. You cannot say, I love God and be living in sin. You cannot say, I love God and say, I love the world. It's like a man who who is married and looks at his wife and says, I love you, and then turns to his mistress and says, I love you so much. That is the pain that God feels when we are living in two separate worlds, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And let me tell you something. When you are living in the kingdom of light and you are living in the kingdom of darkness, your heart is being torn in two. That is why so many of us are struggling. So many of us are sick. So many of us have mental illness. It's just because we are trying to make something holy coexist with something that is unholy. This was not a part of my sermon, but I feel like we need need to talk about this. You are trying to make something holy because you have been given the Holy Spirit to live inside of you, and yet you also are trying to live in the darkness. When the, when the head priest went once a year or whatever into the Holy of Holies to commune with God, to meet in the presence of God, they had to tie a rope around his, his belt just in case they didn't get the purification right, just in case he wasn't holy enough. He went in, and if he wasn't, he died. They had to pull him out again because darkness cannot exist in the presence of God. And so does it surprise you that, you're, that when you are trying to live with God and trying to live with the world, that your heart is at war. You're destroying yourself. You're just, you'd be in less pain if you just chose the world, honestly. It's this tension between that is killing you. Choose God. Because the path that he has given you, the path that, path that he has shown you, is one of eternal promise. It's one of eternal love. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Come to me, all of you who are are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come rest in my love. Come be with me. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. It doesn't matter what the world says. The world is not who we follow. We follow God. We're Christians. You cannot love the Father and the world at the same time. And if you want a biblical proof for that, it's not hard to find. 1 John 2, verse 15. Do not love this world or the things it offers you. The world's going to offer you a lot. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. And what that means is if you love the world, you cannot love the Father. That's what I said before. If you love the world, you do not love the Father. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but they are from this world. And here's the thing. This world is fading away. This is not the final destination, people. God has given us an eternal kingdom, eternal glory, and that is what we should be working to. We work so hard, myself included. This is not like I'm preaching it myself here. We work so hard to to gain as much as we can in this life, to have as much pleasure as we can in this life, and in the end, like, What matters is eternity. We only have 100 years, 120 max here. God is calling us to something that is everlasting, an everlasting kingdom, an everlasting hope. This world is fading away along with everything that people crave, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. You see, God is not done giving you gifts. It didn't end with the transformer. 
He's not done showing you love. If you stay with him, if you are faithful to the end, you follow him. There is an inheritance waiting for you. Eternal life, true freedom, true love. And again, I'm not selling legalism up here, okay? You're saved by, you're saved by faith in God alone. But it's that gift, that Plato car you give him. It's not perfect, but you worked at it. And as you build more Play-Doh cars, they get better and better and better until you're like a YouTube sensation or something. Like, we get better. We're working towards something better. We're working to be more and more like Jesus. That's the promise of the gospel, life transformation. We experience true love with God. Yeah. Okay. So, Turning point. God loved you so much. God loves you so much that he has given you everything. It is Christmas morning. You're surrounded by ribbons and bows and the paper of all the great presents that you just unwrapped. The love that the Father has lavished upon you. You've been set free from your chains. You've been given hope. You've been given life. You have been called a child of God. Everything that is the Father's is yours. And now it's your turn. To offer him a gift that he would love. Your obedience. To say, I will follow you, God. I will turn away from my sins in spirit and in truth. Turn away from the shame. Come out of the darkness. Come into the light and exist fully in his light and in his love. This is only a good decision, but it requires sacrifice. Anyone who says that Christianity is, that requires no sacrifice, that's ridiculous. Christianity was founded on the greatest sacrifice of all. That Jesus, would, Jesus, who was holy and blameless and never sinned, would cut his life short so that you could be set free. That's the gospel. So that you could be transformed. That's the gospel. So that you can live your life as Jesus did. That's the gospel. So that you can do even greater things than Jesus did through the power of his Holy Spirit. That is the gospel. But you got to come into the light. So in a moment, we're going to be opening up the altar for anyone. If you felt touched by this message, if you felt God stirring at your heartstrings about maybe you having unrepented sin, maybe there's an area of your life where you haven't followed Jesus, start thinking about that because we're going to be calling you up to the altar in just a moment. But I want to make one more invitation first before we do that. If there is anyone in this room where you would say, I've never followed Jesus, or you're just not sure of your standing with him right now, am I saved? I don't know. Now is a chance to take that first step of obedience and saying, Lord, I want to turn from my sins. I want to turn over to you. I want to turn to you, and I'm going to let you lead my life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Is there anyone in this room that say, I want to make Jesus my Savior. I want to be a Christian in person and online. Yep, yep, yes. And if you are online, God sees your hand. Go ahead and raise it. All right, now all together, for those who are Christians and those who are coming into the faith, we're just going to pray what I just said, turning from our sins, turning over to God, letting him lead our lives. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus... I know I'm a sinner. I don't want to live that way anymore. So I turn from my sins and turn to you and ask you to be my Lord, to be my Savior, to be my Father. And God, I will follow you for all of my life. 
no matter what it took. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If when you accept that prayer, when you pray that prayer, you are brought into the family of God. You become a child of God. You become a beneficiary of his great inheritance, eternal life, and a family that loves you and wants to support you. Amen? Amen. Now, I haven't forgotten about the rest of you, those of you who are also believe, who are already believers. Myself included, we all have things that we have set aside from God. We all have parts of our lives that we say, well, God, you can invade this far, but no further. Maybe you do have sins that you just keep going back to. Maybe intentionally, maybe it's unintentionally, maybe there is addiction involved. If that's you, when I call everyone up to the altar, please come up. There is no guilt. There is no shame. And we're going to be opening up the altar to everyone. I'm going to be the first one to go down, okay? So number one, if you have sin that you need to repent to the Lord, come up to the altar. Number two, maybe there's an area of life where you're not being obedient to God in your life, in your, in your job, in your relationships. God has told you to do something and you haven't gone. You haven't done it yet. I want you to come down to the altar too. I invite you to come down to the altar too. And maybe, maybe, you know, maybe you didn't even know that following Jesus means keeping his commandments, that following Jesus means obeying him, that means turning away from the world. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Maybe you didn't even know. That's okay. That's why we're here. I invite you to come down and, and, and to, the, to the altar. So why don't you all stand to your feet? Why don't you all stand to your feet? And if you felt a tug or a pull or anything, come down to the altar. And let's, this will be a time for repentance, time for rededication, a time for laying down our sin, laying down our shame at the foot of the cross. And the thing that I love about this is Jesus says that he is faithful and just to forgive you of every single one of your sins. If you give it up to him, it's forgiven. Let's offer up our lives. Let's give it up to him. Let's pray. Jesus, there is no one who is too far from you. There is no sin too great that you can't forgive, God. You see your people. You see how they want to cry out to you. They want to come back to you, Jesus. And I know you'll accept them. You'll accept them as they are, like the son who, wa who wallowed in the pigs and sold his life into just a horrible living. You accepted him back. You ran to meet him. Lord, I pray that you will meet your sons today. I pray that you will meet your daughters today. I pray that you will bless them. I pray that you will anoint them. I pray that you will cut the chain of sin, cut the chain of disobedience. I pray that you will give them supernatural power through your spirit to say no. I don't want to live this way anymore. I can't, I can't coexist with the light and the dark. I want to come to know you more, Jesus. Empower them, God, by your Spirit. Your Spirit gives us this power. Lord, if there's any aspect of our lives that we're holding back from you, God, we just offer it up to you. We give it to you on a silver platter. And Lord, do with me, do with us whatever you want. We sold our lives to you. We have been bought. We have been purchased with a price. Oh, Jesus, we accept your love. Father, we accept your love. 
Lord, this is us saying we love you back. We know what you want. We give it all up to you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you that you loved us first and saw our great need for you. And Lord, as we've heard today, Lord, you want us to love you back. And the best way we can do that is to follow your ways, Lord. So I pray that you'd reveal that to us. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit when you are trying to reveal areas in our lives that aren't yet yielded to you. Lord, help us to be quick to confess and change in the ways that you want us to, Lord. We love you. We're so thankful for your love. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So we're going to um, allow those that are in the front altar, if they want to continue praying, you guys are welcome to stay here. And we're just going to kind of uh, quietly make our exit out the room if you uh, are ready to leave. Um, I just want to remind you that we do have our welcome lunch happening after service in the back. And if you have kiddos, to get them first. And let's just keep this as a place of prayer. We will see you next week.